So good to be together. So good to worship together. So we started, as you heard, and many of you know, we're uh, most of the way through our 28 days of prayer and fasting. We're entering into our last week, starting tomorrow. And, uh, you know, part of the, the vision and the context for what I really believe that God wants to do in and through us is similar to that transformation. You know, many of you heard where my daughter had shared, I said, let's pray together. She's seven years old. I said, let's pray together and ask God what he wants to do during the fast. And she says, I see a picture, I see a butterfly. And immediately my mind went to that incredible transformation of a butterfly going from this like weird looking worm on the ground to like this beautiful butterfly flying through the air. And uh, I truly believe that life changing encounter with God and transformation is available for every single one of us. God shows no favorites, amen? No favorites. So any of us that are willing to seek him, we will find him. And my encouragement to all of us as we jump into this fast, uh, this last week is, it doesn't matter what you've done before today. It's all available to you right now. Amen. And so make a plan, set some stuff aside. And this is not a, man, you should do this because, you know, if you're really a Christian, you're going to do this stuff or the church is doing it, you should do it. It's not that kind of thing. I want you to hear, even in what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about prayer a little bit this morning. And... When we talk about prayer, sometimes it, we can feel guilty for not praying more, and we feel a sense of shame or those kinds of things. Um, I want to be really clear with the fast, with prayer, all of that. Uh, really on my heart this morning is I want you to understand that shame does not come from the Lord. And so any shame that you're feeling is not from him. And we just say no to that in Jesus' name. And what I want you to hear is just a loving invitation of your father to experience greater fullness. That's it. It's not I should. It's a loving invitation, and it's for our good. Amen? All right, so James chapter 5, if you brought a Bible this morning. James chapter 5. While you're turning there, as a church family, we have eight core values. These are eight things that we believe that God has uh, called us to be about. This, these are things that will characterize our culture here at Desert Streams as a church family. And... When we talk about our values, is not just something that pertains to church leaders. This isn't just like for the staff, otherwise I would just have a staff meeting and talk to them about it. But this is for every single member of the family. So if you call Desert Streams your church home, or if you're just checking it out, by the way, welcome. If you're just a guest with us this morning. But we're going to pull back the curtain a little bit and, and let you know this is what we're about as a church family. These are the things that we're going to be intentional about pursuing and guarding and, and, and just being about because we believe that they're the things that God is about for his church. So these are our eight core values. Jesus is our message. We're all about Jesus. We're going to point people to Jesus every chance we get. People are our heart. Greatest commandment is love God and love people. We're just going to love people with every chance that we get. Encounter with God is our aim. Everything we're doing, we're trying to facilitate encounter with God. We talked about it last week. Prayer is our priority. Serving is for everyone. Generosity is our privilege. Because of everything that Jesus has given us, it's our privilege to lay down everything and give it back to him. Excellence is our spirit. God doesn't give us just second best, but he gave us his very best. He gave us everything. And so excellence is the spirit by which we want to serve him. And then the last one, faith and hope are our lens. In a world that is all doom and gloom and everything's terrible, we believe that God is speaking another message. And we choose to believe God for big and great things for ourselves personally, for our church family, for our city together. And then we're going to activate our faith by taking small steps now. Amen? Amen. Y'all with me? All right, so this morning we're going to talk about one of the, the values that might have the greatest potential to change your life this year. Uh, one of the other things we've been talking about as a church family is that we are adopting a growth mindset together, not a fixed mindset. So we're going somewhere together, amen? amen. We're not going to stay the way that we've always been. But God has new things in store for us. There is growth and transformation. So how many of you guys you want to grow this year? How many of you want to experience transformation this year? How many of you, you have some situations and some areas in your life where you would like to see God do something. Yeah. This value could be the key to your growth and your breakthrough and your transformation. Tell the person next to you, prayer is our priority. 
prayer is our priority. James chapter 5, starting in verse 13, this is towards the end of James's letter, and he says, is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith, it'll make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he sinned, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man or woman is powerful and effective. God, as we take a moment just to pray right now, before we go any further, we thank you that prayer is powerful and effective. We thank you that you hear us right now in this moment. We ask that you would, we just invite you, Holy Spirit, to give us revelation, Lord, especially those of us who've been following you for a while. Um, I know that there's nothing I could say this morning that would surprise anybody about prayer. But it's a different thing when you, Holy Spirit, just cause something to explode inside of our souls and suddenly we have this hunger to pray and this longing to be with you. And so we just invite you to do that this morning in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So James, he pastored like one of the first churches ever, a very influential church in Jerusalem. And we know from Acts chapter 9 and chapter 11 that the church suffered some intense persecution. And because of that, they were dispersed. They went to all these other nations fleeing for their lives. And so here you have Pastor James, in his love and his concern for people, he is writing to all of his people who have been dispersed among the nations to encourage them. And what he realizes is that not all of us suffer in the same, at the same time or in the same ways. So just like this morning, we're all in different places this morning, right? So some of us are struggling, others are experiencing great blessing. Some are, you know, sick watching on YouTube after the fact. Others are well. Somebody just lost their job. Somebody else just got a raise. And so here we have Pastor James in his love for his people. He's just writing. He's reaching out in all of their different situations because he wants to encourage them. And this is how he starts. He says, are any of you in trouble? Are you experiencing some kind of hardship in your life? Maybe somebody close to you passed away or divorce or relational conflict. Or maybe you got some financial problems. I have only one piece of advice for you. Pray. Are any of you happy? Like, did you just get a raise? Did you have a baby or grandbaby? Did you get married? I have only one thing that I want you to do. Pray. Sing songs of praise. Any of you sick? If you got an illness in your body, cover your mouth. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you got an illness in your body or your mind? There's only one thing for you to do. Before you go to the medicine cabinet, I want you to pray. Before you call the doctor, actually, would you call some elders of the church and ask them to come pray for you and anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord? And then when they pray in faith, you're going you're gonna to be well. Have you sinned? Are you here and you're just struggling with an area of sin in your life that you can't seem to shake or get rid of? Maybe you got a secret area of sin that just seems to be letting darkness and enemy activity into your life. There's only one thing for you to do. Pray. Go find another Christian. Tell them about what you're dealing with. Confess to them what you've been doing and have them pray for you. God will forgive you and cleanse you. You'll be healed. You catching the theme here? Verses 13 to 18, all about one subject, prayer. It's mentioned in every single verse. And it seems as though James is saying, no matter what you're going through, the best thing that you can do is pray. Prayer. Communicating with God it's an inseparable quality from those who follow him. You see it all throughout scripture. Uh, one of the things I find really interesting is the, the very first mention in the Bible of people who followed God is in Genesis 4, verse 26. And it says, at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. So at the very beginning, they weren't known as Christians. They weren't known as believers. They weren't known as people of faith. They were known as those who call on the name of the Lord, those who pray. That's what set them apart. You remember in Matthew 21 when Jesus goes on a rampage in the temple? He makes a whip, so it's like a premeditated assault. And then he comes in and he's just tossing tables and he's driving people out, cracking his whip. And everybody's like running out, trying to get away, like, oh, like trying to miss that. So he's coming, cracking this whip and yelling at everybody to get out. And then as he does it, he is quoting scripture at them. And he quotes the prophet Isaiah 
And he says, my house is to be a house of prayer. But you've made it a den of robbers. You've turned it into a market. Get all you people selling and stuff in here, trying to make money off of people offering sacrifices. Get that out of here. My house is to be called a house of prayer. We aren't called to be a house primarily of preaching or of religious activity. But first and foremost, we're called to be a house of prayer. And in 1 Corinthians 3.16, the apostle Paul's writing and he says, do you not know that you, he's speaking to Christians, so somebody say, if you're a Christian, say he's talking to me. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? In other words, this building is not God's house. Those of us who follow Jesus, you are his house. You are his temple. And God's house, Jesus said, is to be a house of prayer. Are you tracking with me? So you individually, as a follower of Jesus, you are called to prayer. All of us corporately, there should be the essence of prayer when we're together. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says pray continually. Some translations say pray without ceasing. Prayer should be our priority because it's central to who we are as followers of Jesus. But that said, if I can be honest with you this morning, it's not that I planned on lying, but if I could be honest with you this morning, I don't pray as often as I feel like I should. As much as I try to talk to God throughout my day, as much as I set aside time every day just to be alone with him and just to pray, I just don't feel like I do it enough. Anybody else? You just, there's this low-grade sense of, man, I, I just, I don't know, I just don't feel like I, I pray as much as I should. I, I feel like I should pray more. I want to pray more. Why don't we pray more? Why is it that, you know, we can talk about prayer as our priority, and none of you who have been in church before are like, what? You guys are about prayer here? We know it. But why is it that we don't pray more? Why isn't it our priority? I want to just give you two reasons. I could give you a million, and we could have a million sermons altogether on prayer and all the effects and power behind it and why we pray. But I just want to address two issues why I think that we tend to not make prayer a priority. Number one is busyness. One enemy to prayer is busyness. So when we say prayer is our priority, that language is very intentional because how many of you get busy? And when you get busy, what's the first thing, one of the first things to suffer if it's not a priority? Prayer. Hurry is the death of prayer, somebody once said. How many of you, you've had an amazing conversation with somebody when you were in a hurry? Nobody. Imagine this. Imagine that I walked into my house after a long day. And I greet my wife. I'm so excited to see her. I give her a kiss. And, you know, we've texted throughout the day, maybe had a couple phone calls, you know, but now we're finally in the same room. And, like, we just get to be together, excited to be together. And then imagine I tell her, hey, babe, so uh, you got, I got, like, five minutes. And then, uh, you know, I'm kind of hungry, so, like, I'm going to get some food, and then the game's going to be on. And then after that, you know, it's been a long day, like, I'm going to crash probably, but like five minutes, I really love you, and I'm excited for this time. And then over those five minutes, I look at my watch five times. How good is my marriage going to be? How strong is it going to be? My marriage is going to be jacked up, and so is my back from sleeping on the couch. (laughs) If you want a strong relationship with Jesus, it's the same You have to make prayer a priority. If you want to have a strong marriage, you have to make it a priority to connect. You have to set aside time to be together. You have to guard that. You have to set aside time. You have to plan dates. You got to plan times where you're communicating and sharing, not just how was your day, but you get below the surface. And then you got to plan times to go in the room and close the door and connect in other ways. (laughs) Can I get an amen? When it's your priority, it means that you say no to other things. So busyness can't be an excuse. It can't be an excuse. Because the reality is, is that we make time for the things that are important to us. Or to put it another way, if you're an adult, you go wherever you want, and you stay as long as you want to stay. You do. 
It's up to you. And so it can never be an excuse. Oh, I'm too busy, you know, it's just been really crazy. No, it's just not been a priority. When it comes to busyness, think about Jesus for a second. So on one occasion, he had just healed this guy from leprosy, right? Incurable skin disease at the time. And he tells the guy, hey, don't go tell anybody. Just go show yourself to the priest. But how many of you guys have ever experienced God in such a powerful way that you couldn't keep it to yourself? This dude goes out and he's running his mouth just telling everybody. And so the scripture says in Luke 5, 15, it says, but despite Jesus' instructions to the man, the report of his power spread even faster and vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. So picture this, the word has spread about Jesus. He's healing things that no doctor can heal. Blind people are seeing. This isn't a fairy tale. Like, think about this. Blind people in Santa Cruz, like they're seeing paralyzed people are getting up and they're walking. And most recently he healed this, healed this incurable skin disease. And so all these people are coming. And then to add to that, he is preaching with this wisdom and authority that no one has ever heard before. And they didn't have online teaching stuff. So he had to go, people had to go in person. And so you get the picture. All these people, these crowds are constantly coming to Jesus, vying for his time and attention. Preach to us. Heal us. They're bringing their sick. They're always coming. Now, did Jesus love the people in the crowds? Absolutely. He came into this world to die for them. He absolutely loved every person in the crowds. And even when it wasn't a crowd, he was always taking time to notice the one that nobody else had eyes for. He loved every person. And so he was continually taking time to teach them and to heal and to minister to those who came to him. But what's so interesting is that it says, vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. But the next verse says this, but Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Prayer was his priority. As much as he loved the crowds, he had to say no often so that he could say yes to prayer. If Jesus, the Son of God, needed to withdraw often to get alone with the Father and to pray, how much more do we? Just like Jesus, we all got our crowds, don't we? Maybe they're not like large groups of people showing up on your lawn or like gathering around your table in the break room or at school. But we got things like the crowds that demand our time and our energy, right? So for me, some of my crowds are being a husband and being a father, being a pastor, being a friend. Your crowds might be being a daughter or a son, a student, a friend, a, an employee, a teacher in kids' church, a business owner. I want you to think of your crowds like branches on a tree. So my mom sent me this painting some years ago. And... Uh, You'll see the big tree, and then, I don't know if you can see where you are, but these big roots that go deep down. And then it says, this verse here at the bottom, Isaiah 37, 31, it says, take root below and bear fruit above. And so, this is what it means. If you imagine yourself as a tree, and you've got all the branches of your family, your job, your ministry, your friends, school, all those things, and all these things, life starts to get heavy when it's weighing on you, right? And how many of you, you want to produce good fruit in every area? You want good things to come. Nobody wants to put forth effort and show, have nothing to show for it. And so we long to be fruitful in every area of our lives. But if you're a tree, how are you going to produce fruit? Are you going to focus on the branches? You're going to drive your roots down and connect to the source, Right? And as we drive our roots down and we connect, and who is the source? Jesus said in John 15, 5, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He said, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. So when we connect to Jesus in prayer and in worship and getting around other believers, and when we connect to Jesus, suddenly something weird happens. All the fruit that we were longing for in all these areas, it seemed like we were neglecting those to a certain degree to press in because we said no to some of the crowds. But then suddenly we look behind us and we notice, oh my gosh, look at all this fruit. Look at all this stuff. I was trying really hard in my own strength. But how many recognize that one moment of God's favor yields far more fruit than years of hard labor? Right. Everything changes when we pray, when we connect to the source. 
So what does that mean? Do you want to be the best husband or the best wife? Do you want to be the best student? Have the best career? You want to be the best parent to your children? You want to be the best leader to those that you serve at church? Make prayer a priority. What does it look like for you to often withdraw to get alone and connect to the source? Jesus lived out what he taught in Matthew 6, 33. He said, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you as well. He's talking about the context is all these things that people are worried about. So think about all the stuff that you're worried about, all the things, oh my gosh, are we going to have enough over here? And am I going to, I'm really, some of you moms got mom guilt, and Jesus is speaking to you this morning, if you just get along with me. If you seek first me and my kingdom, all these other things, I'm going to take care of them. That's a good word. We got to flip our mentality from I'm too busy to pray to I'm too busy not to pray. Like I got too many important things in my life that need to be fruitful, that I need to find success. And I got too many things to not pray. Somebody once said, I pray for an hour a day except for the days that I'm really busy. Those days I pray two hours. Because no man or woman's ministry is greater than their prayer life. To be much for God, we must be much with God. We're too busy not to make prayer a priority. The second enemy to prayer is this, unbelief. Think about it. How much are you going to pray if you don't believe God's even hearing you? Sometimes we feel like our prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. We doubt God is listening or that he cares or that he'll actually respond. We doubt that our prayers are really effective. And then what's the result? We don't pray. And we don't really feel that bad about it because we don't believe, we're not convinced that it's doing anything. But let me ask you, if you knew that your prayers were going to be powerful and effective, you knew God is going to answer, what would you do? We would pray all the time and about everything. It'd be the first thing that we do whenever we encounter any situation where there's a need. Remember, James said, whatever you're facing right now, pray. And then he says this next. Verse 16, he says, the prayers of a righteous man or woman is powerful and effective. This is why you should pray. If you and I would grasp the power in our prayers, we would pray all the time and about everything. Uh, Many of you guys know that we encourage everybody here to have something called a pie list. It's a list of three to five people that you come up with between you and the Lord. Three to five people that you know who don't know Jesus or are not walking with him right now. And you make a commitment to pie, P-I-I. You're going to pray for them, that God would encounter them and draw them into relationship with him, that they would be saved. Then you're going to invest in them is the first I. You're going to you invest in relationship. You're going to love on them. You're going to show them what Jesus looks like. And then the last I is invite. You're going to look for an opportunity to invite them to church or to, into relationship with Jesus. And I had this uh, friend named Zach who was on my list for a really long time. Um, he was one of my best friends right, coming right out of high school, which was around the time when God miraculously encountered me, completely changed my life, and I was on a new trajectory, and God brought Zach along my path, and he was this, like, a source of so much inspiration, and he just seemed to have this amazing relationship with God, and he was such a challenge and encouragement and support to me. This is the kind of guy, so we had like a Friday night, a bunch of us are hanging out in the living room, and uh, we're trying to figure out what we're going to do that night, and Somebody's like, oh, we go bowling, or oh, we go to a movie, and, and then Zach pipes up, he's like, or we could read our Bibles and talk about it. Most people rolled their eyes, but I'm like, this is the guy I want to hang out with. And he, uh, I went to college, he ended up going through some really difficult things in his life, and he ended up walking away from God and walking away from the church completely. If there's anybody, I never expected it to happen to him. And so he was on my pie list. And uh, for years, I prayed for him to come back. And we had lots of conversations. I even prayed with him. And it just seemed like he was just like, hmm. And one morning, I was standing on this stage a couple years ago. And I just finished worship rehearsal. I put my guitar down. And then I grabbed my phone off the music stand. 
And I had a text from Zach. I'd heard from him in a while, and he said, Levi, I just had the most amazing prodigal son moment with God. I came back to him, and he filled me with so much love and so much joy, and everything in my life is different now. I know you've been praying for me, and I just want to say thank you. I went up to my office upstairs, and I closed the door, and I got on my knees, and I just started weeping. I don't cry very often, but I just started weeping and thanking God for his faithfulness. Can I encourage you, if you've been praying for someone or something for a really long time, don't give up. I said it last week, like, don't ding-dong ditch God. Everyone who knocks the door will be open, but don't let him open the door to find you not there. Don't offer a one-liner prayer and then run away, oh, God just never showed up. Be persistent. I'm telling you, some of you are here today. I know some of you are here today because you had a grandmother or a mother or a spouse that prayed for years for you. And then God encountered you and now you're here. And now you get to partner with God in praying for other people and seeing the same thing happen to them. Prayer is powerful. We talked last week about how encounter with God is our aim. And I gave you all a challenge. Y'all remember the challenge? to pray for at least one person for a miracle over this last week. I'm not going to make you raise your hands. I hope you did. Some of you guys have been calling me, sharing stories. Uh, Amazing. On Friday, two days ago, uh, Leo and I, we went rolling around in Newhall. Um, I picked him up and we... uh, we just prayed and just said, God, would you just show us who, who you want us to stop for? And so we were just looking around. We had a case of waters in the back seat so we could offer them to people. And so we just prayed, asked God to use us. And then we just driving around looking for people. And the first guy that we saw was this guy using crutches. He actually had like one busted up crutch. And uh, he wasn't walking very well. We pull over and jump out. Leo offers him a water. And uh, we start talking to him and come to find out he's got really bad knee pain. And so we offer to pray for him, and Leo gets down, and he just puts his hand on the, hands on the guy's knee and just begins to invite God to touch him and heal him. And I'm just standing here with a hand on the guy's shoulder and just kind of watching, and this, the dude just starts pouring tears. God just began to touch him. And Leo stands up, and we ask him, you know, what are you feeling? And he's like, I feel all this warmth, like, in my leg, and I feel this warmth in my head, and I just feel so good. And we were able to explain to him that that was the Holy Spirit, that warmth. Sometimes that's how the Holy Spirit manifests his presence is through warmth. And he's beginning to bring healing and he's touching this guy's leg. And he has this encounter with God and we have this amazing conversation with him afterwards. And I walk away just being reminded that the quickest way for us to facilitate an encounter with God for somebody is just to pray for them. Here we are praying for this guy's knee, and suddenly God just begins to touch not only his knee, but he touches his heart. And who knows what God's doing after we walked away. I saw this man once, uh, not too long, well, I guess it was a couple years back now. He was carrying some shopping bags around uh, outside of Sears at the Valencia Mall. Um, it's not Sears anymore, but wherever that like little playground is. And he had this massive limp. He looked like just excruciating pain. His face was wincing every step. And... So I stopped him and I was like, excuse me, I don't mean to be like weird or to bother you, but uh, I couldn't help but notice you have some problem, like some pain with your leg or your foot. And he goes, my foot. And I said, oh, okay, well, um, you know, when did the pain come on? Like what's going on? And he said, it came on yesterday that it's from gout and it's just excruciating. And so I asked him if I could pray for him. I introduced myself, told me his name's Joe. He said, yeah, you can pray for me. And so I just put my hand on his foot, and I just invited God to come and heal him. Jesus, come and take that pain away in Jesus' name. Simple prayer. And I stood up, and I asked him, I was like, do you feel anything? And he's like, he starts, he puts his bags down, and then he starts walking around, and he's got no limp. And he looks at me, it's better. And it was like this straight face, like just kind of in awe. And I was like, dang, I was like, well, where's the pain at, you know? And, and before I had prayed for him, he said it was an 8 out of a 10. And uh, he says, it's like gone down to like a 5. And I said, well, I believe that God finishes what he starts, and so can we just pray again and just ask him to continue touching, touching your foot? And he goes, sure. So we pray again, and uh, actually I actually had a couple other people there with me. We pray again, and... Uh, and then he gets, and he starts going like this, and he's just like, he's like bouncing now, and he's like, man, 
He's like, it's better. And I was like, man, where's the pain at? He's like, it's down to like a one. And I was like, well, come on, let's pray one more time. So we pray one more time. He's like, it's probably still at about a one, but it's like, it's better. And then his wife, who was like in some store, comes out mid-interaction and she sees her husband and she's like, what the heck? And so she comes over, she's like, what church do you go to? And it was so funny, but the amazing thing is, is that this man, this man was healed And his wife suddenly became interested in God and church just because of an offer to pray for somebody that was in need. Prayer is so powerful. But if I can be honest again, I've seen a lot of miracles, a lot of miracles, but the reality is is that not everybody I pray for gets healed. And I don't understand why. It's really confusing to me and it's puzzling. But here's what I've come to realize is that the results are not up to me. My job is to give God an opportunity to move and if he doesn't wanna touch him right now in that way, I still have to believe that he is good, that he is faithful and that he knows what he's doing with that person. And then I gotta move on and go to the next person. Just like, you know, if you would preach the gospel to somebody You tell them about Jesus. Not everybody's going to say, oh my gosh, yes. Let me give my life to him right now. Does that mean that you're going to stop sharing the gospel? No. It means that we say, okay, God, I just trust you with that one. I'm just scattering seed, and it's not all going to fall on good and fertile soil, but I'm just going to move to the next person, and I'm going to pray for the next person. And so I want to encourage you. If you prayed for somebody for a miracle this last week, and you're like, dude, it bombed, like nothing happened. If you got to pray for 10, 15 people before you see one person get touched miraculously, let me tell you that one person is going to be worth it. Just go pray for the next person. Just go pray for the next person. Can I share one more story with you? A few years back, uh, like four years now, my daughter Mia was three years old. And I was texting with my friend Justin. Many of you guys know Justin. Amazing dude. Um, But he had had this massive migraine and he was just laid out, couldn't do anything. So I put my phone down and I told Mia, I was like, hey, Justin's got a really bad headache and you want to pray for him? And she's like, yeah, in her like tiny little cute voice. And so I said, okay. And so I, I lead her, you know, she repeats after me, but she just says, you know, Jesus, please take away Justin's headache. Amen. And then I texted him. I said, hey, Mia, just prayed for you. And he goes, text me back, bro, my, my migraine is completely gone. And he got up and he's like running around just at business as usual God completely healed him. Listen, God is listening and answering the prayers of three-year-olds. We are seeing answers to prayer just this month as we've been fasting and praying together. Somebody got healed sitting right about there on Wednesday night when we were here worshiping and praying together. I'm not going to steal anybody else's testimony. I'm going to let them share it. Hey, come on. Next Sunday is one of the most powerful Sundays that we have every year. Worship and testimonies. There are some awesome things that God has been doing. I'm excited to hear about all of them next Sunday. So we'll save that for then. But I'm telling you, as we press in this last week, I'm believing God for way more. A whole lot more testimonies, a whole lot more moments of him showing up and responding to our prayers. Amen, amen. Come on. I hope God's stirring up your faith a little bit this morning. The prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. And not to say this, that, you know, the prayers of the righteous, you may hear that and you're like, well, dude, I'm not righteous. (laughs) I don't know who you're talking to, but it's not me. You know what makes us righteous? Faith in Jesus Christ. We are not righteous by our own works or by our own behavior. The reality is, is that all of us have sinned and, and our sin separates us from God. No amount of good deeds or our own kind of righteousness could fix that problem. And so God did what only he could do. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to come and he died on the cross for yours and my sins. And now the good news is that anybody who believes in him will not perish, will not go to hell, will not spend one more moment separated from God, but will come back into relationship with him for all of eternity and be declared before God as righteous. You believe in Jesus And immediately God declares that you are righteous and your prayers are powerful and effective. If you haven't made that decision, my encouragement to you this morning is to give your life to Jesus. Confess your belief in him. Trust in him to forgive you of your sins. He will forgive you. All of it will be removed and nothing separating from you 
in God anymore for all of eternity. Believe in him this morning. And if you've believed in him, come on, make prayer your priority. There's nothing keeping you from him. And there's nothing keeping him from answering as long as we pray according to his will. Amen? A prayerless Christian is a contradiction in terms. Our life as Christians is to be filled with prayer. And again, hear me, what I said at the beginning is that God longs for relationship with you. Do you realize, like, Scripture talks about how God knows, he knows exactly what you're going through, and he knows exactly what you need before you even talk about it. So why pray? Why would he want us to pray if he already knows everything, he knows what we need, and he wants to answer? Because he wants relationship. He longs for relationship. He loves when you talk to him. He loves when you draw near, when you just come and spend time with him and not for five minutes and do this ten times. And that's his invitation. Will you spend a little more time with me? Do you hear him? Not just here, but do you hear him here? Will you spend a little more time with me? There's so much I want to do. There's so much I want to share with you. I want to invite the worship team to come back up. Um, at the end of last year, you know, I was reflecting on 2022 and looking ahead to 2023. And this question came into my mind as I was praying was, what's the most life-changing thing that you could do? If there's one thing that I could do that would change my life the most, what would it be? And surprisingly, the answer came fast. Pray X amount of time every day. That amount is neither here nor there between me and the Lord, but I made a commitment to do it every day for 365 days, 29 days in, and I'm telling you, I don't know why I didn't do this sooner. I've been really following Jesus for about 20 years, and everything in my life, I, I notice, seems to rise and fall on my prayer life or with my prayer life. The more I pray, the more God's life and his love is flowing into me. The more I pray, the more joyful I am. The more I pray, the more my heart just seems to be tender and I just find myself tearing up at the things of God and in moving. The more time I spend with God in prayer, the more I find myself becoming that point of God encounter for everybody I come into contact with. It changes everything. I'm learning what James had learned. See, he didn't just tell us, hey, pray about everything. You're happy, sad, whatever, just pray. He actually, so we know from history, not from scripture, but from history, we know that he had a nickname, Camel Knees. I don't know that I want that nickname, but he prayed so much that his knees were messed up and people were like, bro, Camel Knees. <laughs> I'm learning what Jesus demonstrated and what he lived out, and that is that, you know, Jesus didn't just tell us to pray, but if you often withdraw, Look at the kind of ministry that can be sustained by the power of the Holy Spirit if you will often withdraw to be with the Lord. And so I want to encourage you. The most life-changing thing that you can do, that you can give yourself to, after you've given your life to Jesus, is to pray. It's truly powerful and effective. This is why we're praying and fasting right now. This is why we're finishing this week with 40 hours of continual prayer in this room. You can sign up for a one hour time slot like you heard about earlier, jump on our website. This is why we encourage you to submit a prayer request because there is a team of people that are committed to interceding and lifting those things up before the Lord. I can tell you how many testimonies we've had just from this year of people who have submitted prayer requests. This is why we have prayer tables available at the end of every service and encourage you, come if you need prayer for anything. Why? Because as a church family, we are committed to making prayer our priority because we believe that there is power in prayer. Amen? Amen. Will you stand with me?